Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you are here today on this. We have a super rainy, cold day here in Pennsylvania. Hopefully it's better where you are. I'm Lisa Leitner. If you haven't met me, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to start right away. I have 102 and hopefully we will gather up more people as time goes on. But I want to be mindful of your time because I know many of you are taking lunch breaks and things like that. With me today is Tara Sumter from Seeds of Learning. Anything that we talk about today, um, I will put links and things in the comments as we're chatting, but if you follow my page or if you subscribe to my email, you will get an email with all the links and all the things that we talk about today. You'll get that as a follow-up. So if we mention a resource of some kind, don't feel obligated to grab the name of it or whatever. I will send it out. Tara also has a book about executive functioning, and the reason I invited her here today is, and I'm sure many of you have had this kind of phenomenon going on. And by the way, give us a like or a follow or, or not a like or a follow, a like or a smiley face or something just to let us know that you're here. Make sure that we're seeing some people. If you want to tell us where you're from, that's great. But like many of you, I follow a lot of disability and special education and IEP kind of pages. And Tara's stuff started showing up in my feed. I don't remember when. And just her her memes and her graphics and her quotes and her sayings. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, like, this is fantastic. This is great. She really gets it as far as executive functioning. And especially when we were just chatting earlier today, she said one of the things that she definitely wants to talk about is why are executive functioning interventions so hard to get? And that, right, like preaching to the choir. I know you all. That's why you're here today, because you're like, why are executive functioning interventions so hard to get? So if you're new to my page, I'm Lisa Leitner. I'm an IEP advocate and have been since 2010. And I will let Tara also introduce herself and say hi and anything else she wants to add. So go ahead, Tara. Well, I want to start by saying thank you so much for having me today. I'm honored that you asked me to come on your Facebook page or to have the event. So thank you so much, Lisa. My name is Tara Sumter. Like you said, I am a speech language pathologist that specializes in executive function. I won't take time today to explain how I ended up on that path, but it's <laughs> been, we're pushing a couple decades here that I have been uh, as uh, specializing in this area of executive function. Way before it was cool to talk about it, way before it was a buzzword, I was eyeball deep in all the research and creating therapy to, to support my students. So I am, as Lisa said, I'm an author. I'm the author of a book called The Seeds of Learning. It is an integrated cognitive approach to learning. So I'm trying to put together these different pieces and parts to try to help speech language pathologists, but also teachers and parents understand how these different aspects of cognitive processing work together. Because what may look like a reading issue may be an executive function issue. It may look like a language difference may look like an executive function need. So a lot of these things are um, very intertwined and it's important to understand that. I am also an international speaker, so I present regularly. I'm actually headed to Michigan on Friday, so got my bag packed. I've got like six weeks I'm on the road, so my. presenting. I do, I'm um, the founder and owner of Seeds of Learning, which is a private practice here in the Cleveland, Ohio area. We have two offices outside of Cleveland. And then um, last but not least, I run an online educational network for SLPs, parents, educators, and allied professionals. It's a place to learn. I would say it's the best resource that I have. And Lisa, I'll give you a link to that too. There's about 700 professionals from over 20 countries. So it's a pretty incredible way to learn about executive function and the related cognitive processing together. Okay. So that's me. Great. And I'm yes. a mom. I have three girls. That's, <laughs> that's that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will send that information out if you're, if you want to learn more about how to get involved in that. If, if you're like, yes, this is knowledge that I need. So I said just a minute ago that, you know, the reason, the reason I invited you here is that so often you post things that I'm like, aha, oh my gosh, yes. You know, and it just really resonates with me and many of the, the kids who I've advocated for over the years. But something that you said recently about executive functioning was that you said too often, and, and I'm paraphrasing, too often parents and educators that we jump to the advanced executive functioning skills and not the beginner executive functioning skills. So, and that we miss out on identifying and teaching the foundational executive functioning skills. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? 
Yes, I'd love to. So if I can first start by talking about what is executive function? Executive function, one of my favorite definitions is by Russell Barkley. He is the godfather of executive function, ADHD. His definition is that executive function is self-direction for a future goal. And so when we, there are really two parts to this definition. It's the self-direction, which is cueing from the inside out for something that's going to happen later. So we have to be able to cue from the inside while also being able to have a vision of what's to come later. And this gets into working memory, which maybe we'll have the chance to talk about a little bit later. Something important to remember about executive function is that executive function is the cure. It's the cure of a doer. And this is where the system gets really confusing is because we have all of these doer systems, our speech processing, our language processing, our literacy development, right? Our writing, all of these things, these are doers. These are workers in the brain. And the executive function system, its job is to cue the doers in how and when and with what kind of intensity. So he's like the guy behind the curtain sort of pulling the strings. So he's not the one actually doing the work, but the one facilitating it and orchestrating it, conducting it, if we think about it in those terms. So oftentimes when people think about the executive function system, what they think about are skills like organization, planning, prioritizing, right? Those tend to be the skills. And those executive function skills, they're important ones, but they are some of our highest level executive function skills. So I've organized our executive function skills. I like to think of it in terms of a plant, right? Um, seems to be a common theme in my professional life that I like to think of things in terms of growth and, and planting. And so I've broken the skills into roots, stems, and flowers. And this prioritizing and, organi and organization, these types of skills are the flowers that we see bloom on the plant if there is a strong, healthy root system and a strong, healthy stem to the plant, right? But the, the flowers are what bring the bright color and catch people's attention when they walk by, which is why those are the ones that are identified so frequently mm -hmm. and not really the root system. So um, if we think about the root system, we're really looking at uh, skills such as perception. How well do we perceive our environment? Are we aware of the people and the objects and the items in my environment? And am I aware of myself? Am I aware of my own thoughts, my own actions, my own perceptions? So that's our most basic level of our root system is that perception, our awareness. And then after that, we're going to be talking about attention, right? What is our attention capacity look like? Another really important part of our root system is our working memory. This is our verbal working memory and our nonverbal working memory. And working memory, in short, people who know me, I've seen a couple of names pop up here who I know. Hello to my friends. Um, or, you know, people who are familiar with my work, that working memory is one of my favorite topics. It's such a fascinating, fascinating system, but it's it's holding on to information in the short term so that we can operate on it. And it really only lasts a handful of seconds. So it's very, very short term processing. But that becomes a real big need for a lot of our students is working memory because they can't hold on to the information long enough to be able to operate on it. So they appear forgetful, right? Things like that. Um, or they need things to be repeated or um, and unfortunately, they end up, you know, becoming labeled as behavior problems or lazy or they're just not trying hard enough because they don't have the underlying skill. And then the last really big root system skill is inhibition. So inhibition is our ability to uh, restrain ourselves, to hold ourselves back from an impulse, right? And when I talk about the ways that we can support, I think you'll ask me a little bit later about ways that we can support some of these skills, that becomes a really important one, especially when it comes to inhibition, because our kiddos who struggle with inhibition need support and they often get discipline and punishment 
because they seem to be the distractible, impulsive, right, types of kiddos. So we tend to go a behavior approach for them, which is often not the best. Right. And that's where I usually get called in because the child is being punished for literally being punished for a lack of skills. And yeah, you know, and you can't, I always say you can't reward and punish a set of skills into a child. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, they love that. So, okay. So for the parents who are checking in today and they've, they've been told, you know, Maybe they haven't been told, but maybe they recognize like, so, you know, cause like you said, the, the flower things that we recognize is the messy locker, the messy desk, the lost homework assignments, the, the just forgetting to hand in. I have a lot of kids who do the homework and never hand it in, or they forget to bring it home, or, you know, we could go on and on and on with our examples. And then of course the lack of impulse control and being impulsive and those kinds of things. So for the parents who are watching and saying like, yes, I know my, my child is struggling with um, executive functioning. Like, where do I start? What's the first step either, you know, privately or with the school. And I can, you know, we, I can talk about submitting letters for evaluations, but where would you recommend that they begin or how? Yeah. I mean, my favorite place for families to go first is to a well-respected neuropsychologist. Um, that would be my favorite place to start. They tend to do the broadest type of evaluations that are really going to capture a lot of the executive function system. I think it's important to remember that all, you know, there are good and bad professionals in every profession. So it becomes really important for parents to do their homework and to talk to other families and talk to other professionals to get a good referral before you, because a neuropsych evaluation is very time consuming. It's very expensive. So you want to make sure that, you know, you have somebody who's very well recommended. So I would go that route for sure. That's my, my because again, they get into working memory well, typically, and a lot of those components of the executive function system, more so than just scale, you know, a rating scale, which is how a lot of the executive function assessment is done. With that being said, uh, it's really important to remember that the best assessment for executive function is a dynamic assessment. And what dynamic assessment is, is dynamic assessment is looking at performance or looking at observation across different domains. So meaning when I do an assessment, I'm looking at how they're processing through, you know, in the speech domain, the language domain, the literacy domain, the math domain, you know, we're looking at it across and I'm trying to create connections, patterns of processing. I call it pop, that we're looking for pop, patterns of processing across these domains. And then we also want to look for patterns across settings. So we're looking at, you know, we're trying to connect dots between school or maybe specific teachers. We may find that a student is much more successful in one classroom than another for lots of reasons, right? And all of that is going to give us lots of good observational dynamic assessment. I've already name dropped Russell Barkley, who if people are dealing with ADHD, he's a name you should know. He has a million and one resources out there in the way of books that are phenomenal. But he has gone in his one of his most recent, heavy, more research-based books, he's gone as far to say that standardized assessment of executive function is not only the worst way to assess it, it's actually negligent. So we need to start looking beyond standardized assessment. So um, let yeah. me just interrupt you for one second, because I know the schools kind of rely on the brief. Yeah. Um, which is... I know it's something, something, something executive functioning, a brief rating. Is it rating something? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know exactly what it's doing. Yeah, it's for. something rating. I don't use it myself. Yeah. But I know it's it's a yeah. it's a, a numerical assessment so much. And you're saying that that's not that is what the biggest researchers are saying in the field of executive function. Yeah. Okay. The biggest researchers in the field are making it very loud and known very clearly that standardized assessment is the worst way to is assess executive function. And the reason why this is, is again, because of the nature of what executive function that system does, it regulates something else. And what we're assessing is the something else. So we're looking at how well they can uh, you know, pay attention to a paragraph 
Well, now we're assessing a paragraph and their ability to read or look at the paragraph, or we're looking at their speech, or we're looking at language. They're having to read something. So, so we're always assessing the cure in conjunction with the doer. So we can never get a clear picture of just the cure by itself because the cure doesn't function by itself. It is cueing something else, another processing component. So to take one standardized measure and say, this is the child's EF profile is negligent because we have to try to find patterns across domains, across settings that bypass, that look at all the different doers to find the consistency of how the cure functions across all these domains. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. It does. To, yeah, it does. I mean, to me, I don't, you know, a beginner parent who's new to this and has like a little that has just been diagnosed with ADHD, you know, they may not be there yet, which is why I will keep this on my website until it's outdated, which at 10 or 20 years, it may be, who knows? Yeah. So it, it does make sense. Okay. So you're thinking. And then, oh, can I, can I interrupt you real yes. quick? Meredith asked, can I get a link to a resource for that? Yeah. It was Barkley talks about it in his book, executive functions. He has a sub it's, I think he published in, no, I don't remember, but it's called executive functions by Russell Barkley. It's a phenomenal book. It's heavy. It's a research-based book, but it's, it's a good one. Okay. Sorry. And, and I will look that up and send that out with, you know, like, and I will also send out, I have a little bit of information. It's, it's a pretty high level view of, of what a neuropsych is, but I do also have information on my site about how to ask for an IEE, which is an independent education evaluation, because when you hear neuropsych, you're just like, great, let me just ask for an IEE. Let me, let's put the brakes on that because a couple of things you have to have, you have to have dem demonstrated proof that your child needs an IEE, first of all. Second of all, if a school is going to deny you an IEE, they are legally required to file for due process. And a lot of parents aren't always ready for that. And they get that notice in the mail. And they're like, what? what? And what was my third thing? Oh, um, you only get one IEE per issue. So if you ask for an IEE for executive functioning and the school says, okay, yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. And you go out and get it and you're not thrilled with it. That's it. You don't get to ask for another IEE for executive functioning. Um, so you don't want to waste it, so to speak. You want to make sure that you're very well thought out in requesting it, having the data that your child needs. Because I know at least around here in Philadelphia, you're looking at five to seven thousand dollars for a good neuropsych. So, you know, so and schools shouldn't just hand them out to anyone who asks for them either. You know, they can't just be doing that. <laughs> so you have to be really well thought out. But but it's an option. Um, thank you for you somebody public or posted the book link. Claire is asking, what would you suggest then when a brief is all that is used when trying to get EF looked at? Yeah, that's a really good question. I saw that on there. I was hoping you would um, pull that one out. I would definitely be looking at lots of different settings and trying to yourself pull apart what are um, what's the connecting thread of difficulty that you're seeing. So, you know, you can think in terms of are we having trouble perceiving information in all of these settings or all of these domains? Are we having trouble attending all of these settings and domains? What about inhibition? What about working memory? Trying to look through the system or maybe it's self-monitoring. Are we having trouble monitoring our own actions, our own thoughts, our own emotions, perceptions, whatever that may be, and trying to find the thread in lots of settings. So you're going to be wanting to pull in a lot of team members, right? The teachers need to be a part of this. The people who see our children outside of school need to become a part of this because EF is a real, it's such a broad, broad processing system. It's really that conductor of, of all that we consciously learn. And so uh, it's not going to be, one test is very unlikely to capture that you know, looking at observation, again, across settings becomes really, really important. Um, I do have a resource in my online educational network that's about a 45-page observational assessment tool that members have access to that helps like guide from a dynamic perspective. What are, what are the questions I'm asking myself as I process through an assessment with a child for all the different skills? But really pulling and looking across settings, looking across domains, what is the common thread? That's that really needs to be the goal okay. of a good assessment. Something else I wanted to mention too, and then I'll be quiet nope, for a second. 
<laughs> I, that I forgot to say earlier when you when I was talking about what is executive function, I think it's so important for parents to know that executive function regulates our thoughts, our emotions, our perceptions, and our actions. And the reason why this is so important is because kiddos will come to me with lots of diagnoses, right? They have ADD, ADHD, ASD, ODD, OCD, right? They have all of these diagnoses and the parents feel overwhelmed. Like there's all these things wrong, right? The common thread here is dysregulation, typically, right? The common thread here is that there's dysregulation around our emotions. And so that's gonna bring with it a set of diagnoses from a psychologist. Or if we have dysregulation of our actions, then that's going to bring with it its own set of diagnoses because different professionals target these areas differently, thoughts, perceptions, actions, emotions, right? And so it's important to remember that our kids don't have these all of these isolated diagnoses. The brain doesn't work that way. The brain is this fascinating interconnected system. And we're just humans trying to explain it to the best of our ability, which most of the time isn't that fantastic. You know, we're trying, but all of these things are related and we have to figure out why. Uh, and usually there's some um, something going on within that EF system. That's so as you're talking, you're like basically making me want to blow up about a third of my blog and like start over, right? Because <laughs> I, um, you know, no, because we do focus on things like emotional regulation. And when we have these conversations about emotional regulation skills, like EF never really enters the picture for the commoner. Not, you know, and I'm, I mean, I'm just like a lay person for the most part when it comes to this stuff, like, like anyone. I may have more experience with seeing kids who have these struggles, but that doesn't make me, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist or an EF specialist. So that's interesting. Okay. So I started doing this in like the late 2000s and the early 2010s. And that seems to be when executive functioning kind of popped on, I'm going to say for, for, for the IEP crowd, the parents who were engaged with their IEP and having discussions with other parents and advocates and stuff like that. It seems like that is when the whole executive functioning entered the picture. And so now here we are 10 or 15 years later, and you're up here, which is good because right, that's where the science and the research and all this stuff needs to be. But schools are definitely still here. And what I'm seeing as an advocate is parents and teachers see the flower or you know, the petals falling off the flower, as it were. I mean, they say, you know, he can't, he can't order his homework, he can't do all these things. And what I see is I see a lot of accommodating of executive functioning skills but I don't see a lot of teaching of executive functioning skills. So what do you think as advocates and parents who have kids and, and maybe even the parents are struggling with as well, like what can we do to begin to close that gap until teachers and schools start to catch up? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. You know, executive function right now is something that's very hard to teach. And I think why is because it takes time for the people on the ground, right? And I'm I'm a clinician. I, I definitely am a weird clinician in that I live in this world of loving research and creating based off of research. So I'm not your typical clinician, but I'm still a clinician that works with, with clients and teachers, right? We are the ones on the ground doing the intervention, doing the teaching. And the work hasn't, the research hasn't really gotten to a level of having great intervention systems yet. They they just haven't. I will tell you that, and we were talking about this before we went live, a lot of the presenting that I do and a lot of the trainings that I do are with school districts. And they are trying as fast as they can, as hard as they can to try to learn what they need to, to support their EF students in the classroom and in intervention settings. but we can only move so quickly, right? And, um, but they really are trying. What I'm seeing school districts do is just incredible, keeps me inspired, keeps me hopeful, right? They really, really are trying, but it's, there just isn't a whole lot of information out there quite yet. What I will say in terms of the intervention that is typically done, it is typically very tool focused, so it's what I call tool-focused intervention. So we'll see the recommendations of planners 
or to-do lists or timers or things like that. And it's important to remember that those are tools that can be used effectively if there is an executive function system that can use them. An adequate executive function system has to use. Well, the and tools. that's what, you know, I see all these like assignment books and then, you know, this, you know, this accommodation that the student's supposed to go at 2.30 every day and check in with the teacher. I'm like, first of all, the kid loses the assignment book. And then B, he forgets to check in with the teacher at the end of the day. So what what are we doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. What are we doing? Yeah, that, right. That's exact. <laughs> that's exactly right. So the tools, again, I always say, like, what are tools? You know, a, a screwdriver, a hammer, right? A nail, all of these things are types of tools, but they don't work if I don't have a functioning arm in order to use them, right? It's the same thing with the executive function system. So I think we need to start changing the conversation around what does EF intervention look like? And I will tell you, that's a very complicated topic. I have, you know, my educational network, I have seven modules that explains this. It's a very, how we do intervention is very, very detailed because it's such a broad scope of, of practice. I will go into some specific things today that, that parents can do for sure. And I'm working on my second book right now, which is the EF intervention. It's the intervention that of scaffolding cognition, right? So hopefully that's done soon. So, but I want to answer your question about accommodations because I think accommodations definitely serve a purpose. And think of it in terms of if I broke my leg and I would go to physical therapy, right? But I would also have crutches. And the crutches would serve as my accommodation. They would be my support while I'm going to therapy to rebuild the strength. And so it's like a teeter totter. I would hope that with accommodations, as we get cognitively stronger, the need for the accommodations would drop. That's always my goal. Because if we're always needing a lot of accommodations, then we're never going to be fostering independence. Right. So we need to be working towards strengthening cognition and their ability to be independent while, while decreasing the amount of accommodations. But if we have a kiddo who is really struggling, right, then he's got to we got to come in with a lot of accommodations to provide the support while we're also working over here to strengthen the cognition. OK, hopefully that helps. OK, OK, let me get because so, the questions are starting to. Speaking of scaffolding, um, <laughs> why is EF not on a spectrum like everything else? Not all EF issues for all kids are the same. Some do improve. And yeah, again, you're sure. yeah. you're actually one of the one of the few SLPs I've met. I think in schools it often falls to either the special ed teacher or the OT. You're one of the few SLPs I know who does this. I don't know. Elaborate on that a little bit, or. Um, about um, uh, well, about about the the her, the whole suggestion oh, being a, the spectrum, and then who should address it? PT, OT, speech. Yeah, that's everyone. that's a good question. So the first part of that is: is it on a spectrum? Absolutely, everything, every type of skill is on a spectrum of I can't do it at all, or I can do it completely independently, and we fall somewhere in there. The the what gets complicated with executive function is that there's so many skills at different functioning levels, and then those skills regulate other skills. So working memory really impacts how we develop speech and language and literacy. And planning and self-monitoring and organization is really important when it comes to math along with working memory. So there are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's very complicated. It's not an easy picture like some other types of learning can be a little bit simpler, I feel like. As for, I think one of the comments in there was talking about or who, who's, whose realm is it, right? Yeah. I would say EF needs to be in everyone's realm because, again, what does it regulate? Everything. 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 So anyone who works with children and provides intervention or is teaching them needs to have an understanding of executive function. It doesn't just, it's not just one person. We need to understand, you know, an SLP, executive function is critical to speech and language development. And so e, um, SLPs need to have an understanding of that, how executive function regulates or, or relates to executive function. Uh, bleh, let me say that again. <laughs> Words are hard, right? So SLPs need to understand how executive function relates to speech and language development. 
a literacy teacher or a literacy specialist and, and our early elementary teachers need to understand the role that executive function plays in literacy development because it's massive, right? Our math teachers need to know that executive function is more is the most critical cognitive component in math. And we have lots of research that shows that math requires more executive function than any other subject. Hmm. So we could look at, you know, example after example. And of course, our psychologists who work in counselors, um, our social workers, people who work with the emotional sides of things, they need to understand executive function because they have to know how it relates to emotional regulation. So I think everyone should know about it and know how it integrates into the, the what they specialize in, which is why in my online educational community, we have all kinds of professionals I mean, oh, there's, okay. and parents. I mean, there's teachers to SLPs, to OTs, to social workers, to school psychologists. I mean, you name it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay. I'm going to read Sherry's question and then I will answer it from an IEP perspective before you um, answer it. So if we are in a meeting to determine what assessments should be done and they mentioned the brief, is there a name of a different one to request or just say that isn't enough? She said, I hope that makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. So let me just tell you, Sherry, from an IEP perspective, you've probably heard this phrase before, schools are required to ident to evaluate in every area of suspected disability. If they don't suspect it, you have to bring it to their attention so that they do suspect it. I never recommend that a parent request specific assessments for the following reasons. One is that you don't know if they even have anyone on staff who, you know, per the assessment protocols, you know, can even give that assessment. Second, if the assessment doesn't go the way you hope it will go, you've kind of started to close the door on that IEE. The reason being, you ask for a brief, they do the brief, the brief says your child has no executive functioning issues. When you go to request that neuropsych, they're gonna say, what? She asked for the brief, we did the brief. And that kind of closes the door. Whereas if you say, I see my, my son struggling with executive functioning, he does this, he does this, he does this, he does this. And again, just bring those areas of suspicion to them and let them decide what assessments they're going to provide. And are there, I mean, what, what are some other ones? I don't want to say necessarily that you want, want to ask for. And if you want to ask for it, that's up to you as a parent. But what are some other ones that parents should be aware of or look for? I guess yours sounds like. My, mine is a guide okay. for how to organize observation because okay. that's the best assessment measure for executive function. If we're if we're looking at standardized assessment time and time again, it'll be it'll be really, you know, it, it could be very difficult because especially especially our twice exceptional kiddos, these kiddos in particular fall through the cracks because what we test are the doers. And their doers may be off the charts high, right? They're really, really strong. And so the read that we get on these kiddos is really strong. And then when they can't get their homework done and get it turned in on time or, or stay organized or all everything's crumpled in their backpack or their locker's a mess, right? Then everyone just says like, well, I don't know, they should be able to get it together. They're <laughs> a super smart kid. But but they're, you know, we have to be able to look at the patterns. Again, I keep coming back to this idea because it is patterns. It's not one assessment tool. It's what are the observational dynamic patterns that we're seeing in this child's life? And that's that's going to be hard, I think, for a school. I, I hope schools can broaden how they see executive function, that, that it has to reach beyond the school because what's happening at home, what's happening in other settings that's where I, that's where like a psychologist or a neuropsychologist can okay. be helpful. I would recommend SLPs, but there aren't many of us that do this. <laughs> so hopefully I'm changing that. I'm working hard to change that. Okay. So you, you bring up some good points because IEPs, you know, and if, if we're talking a lot about school-based skills and executive functioning as it relates to school, because that is where kids spend the most of their time. And it's where I think the most is demanded from them to perform or produce, IEPs have, of course, become a really litigious area. It's very data-driven and it is very case-law-driven. So schools are going to look for 
assessments and not necessarily guidance sheets. And they're going to look for evidence-based practices and like what's a curriculum. Like we need an evidence-based curriculum to implement. We can't just do good ideas, you know? Um, so how, how would you say like, how can we, you know, do this groundswell of getting this, this kind of new thinking into practice? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to keep asking for it. And I, I always believe that education is our best tool, right? We have to provide education to other people and say, here, I learned this. What do you think? People only know what they know, right? We can't get blood from a stone. So if, if they don't know the intervention, now what I would tell you is there are not there are not curriculums out there. Again, we are, my team is actively working on that. So check back in a year or so. And I'm hoping that we have something out there for teachers and for parents that is something cognitive-based, scaffolded, obviously research-based, evidence-based. But in the meantime, we have to look to the researchers and the information that's coming out there. So Russell Barkley, Dawson and Gare, they have some really great resources out there. Sarah Ward is another good, she's a speech language pathologist. Sarah Ward has some great resources. Obviously, my book can help people see the connections between executive function and other types of learning needs, literacy, language, those types. My online educational community, again, is the best resource I have. I mean, that's where I'm teaching everyone and training everyone on how to do all of this. So those are really the best resources I think that we have, but there aren't a whole lot of, you know, we can't say here's the here's the lesson plan yet. We're not, as a field, we're just not there quite yet. Again, a lot of the recommendations tend to be tool-based that are out there right now. Yeah, they are. But there are certain things that parents can do. Or did you want to, am I, do you want to? No, no, go, no, go ahead. I'm just, I'm trying to look through the questions. Okay. So there are four main things that I'm going to recommend for parents. Okay. So the first one tends to be a really great uh, a need that a lot of our kiddos who have executive function needs um, need our support with attention. And one of the best tools that we can use for supporting their attention is what I call reflexive questioning. And reflexive questioning is giving the child, we're reflecting back to the child and giving them the opportunity to self-regulate instead of directing them. Again, executive function is building that internal director. We're building the self-director inside of the child. So if we tell them what to do, we're doing the directing for them. All right. So reflexive questioning allows us to sort of reflect back the issue. So some really great, great questions for attention. When we see that the child is not paying attention, we can say, where are your thoughts right now? So I'm meeting the child where they are, which is at the level of the distraction. I'm going to say, where are your thoughts right now? And then I'll say, is that important right now? Because I want to know, is, is that important? They might say yes. They might say no, right? But we're going to see if they can prioritize. Is that important right now? No, where should our thoughts be right now? Oh, they should be on my homework. You're right. Can you show me that? And so what we've done is we've helped the child self-direct. We've met them where they are at the level of their distraction and then giving them the tools to route themselves back. So that's one practice method of self-direction, right? Of them, instead of going, pay attention, right? Look here, what are you doing? right? We're letting their brain practice the self-directing, that refocusing of attention, which is really the key to success. So those questions again, where are your thoughts right now? Is that important right now? Where should our thoughts be right now? And can you show me that? Can we get back there? Okay. So those are so, so one really, really powerful way that we can meet them where they are with their attention need. The second thing uh, that I find a lot of parents struggle with a lot is children who struggle with initiation, getting started, right? Okay, so let's talk about initiation for a second. Initiation fundamentally comes down to a difficulty with planning. And I'm gonna tell you why. 
there's two parts to this. Okay. So the first part of this is that they don't know where to start because they can't plan out the activity. So they're faced with the worksheet, right? And they just don't know where to start or they're faced with this big activity and they can't chunk it out and they can't plan it. So they struggle with initiation because they don't know where to start because there's a planning weakness or a planning need there. So that's one aspect of this. The other aspect is that because they might be able to plan, but the plan might not be a good plan for them. Therefore, they feel overwhelmed. The first step feels too big. And so they're paralyzed and they can't get started. I always said that the right plan is the one that works for each individual child. I feel overwhelmed with doing the laundry, right? I don't want to do the laundry. I don't want to fold it. I want it to stay there in the bag, you know, in the basket. So my plan has to incorporate small bits, right? With a show on, I'm listening to a podcast, I'm doing something else. Our children who are feeling overwhelmed by a task, they may be able to tell you a plan. But then when you say, how does the plan feel to you? They're going to say it feels too much. It feels too big. So that means it's not a good plan for them. So we need to go back and revise it, right? So this idea that, that another person can give a plan to a child or chunk out an assignment for a child does not mean that that's the answer because that method, that chunking, that planning may be still too much for that child. So the way that I do this with my own clients is that we'll create the plan. Once the plan is done, I ask them, I'll say, how does this feel to you? And they'll say, eh, I'm not sure. So I'm gonna say, okay, how does step one feel for you? Like, how does that very, you know, that step one feel? And if they say it feels overwhelming, I know they're going to struggle to get started. So we'll revamp it and we'll make that step one and the step two even smaller. So really helping our kids create plans for what might seem like very mundane tasks and breaking it down and asking them, how does this feel to you? Does this feel like something that you can do? Can you get started with that first step and see what they think? And if they say no, then you know it's not a good plan and you've got to revise it. So that's, that's, yeah. So, I mean, no, that's just when you tell a child and parent, you know, or you have some old school parents who just think ADHD isn't even a thing because those, those folks still exist. When you say go clean your room and it doesn't happen, this is mm -hmm. why. This yes, is exactly that's, why. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. One of my children, so I, I didn't tell, but I have three daughters. Uh, I won't point out which one, um, even though if she listens to this, she'll know which one it is, but she won't listen to this. It's okay. But she, yeah, the room is the problem. And so we have to create a plan in very small bites and it's one area, one section of the room at a time. So from here to here, can you clean this? And then once that's done, come back to me and we'll do something else. Then we'll come back and have another section. But yeah, it just becomes too much, too overwhelming at once. When you say, yeah, can you go clean your room? Okay, sorry to interrupt <laughs> yeah. you. You had two more to go, I think. Two more, point. two more to go. So the next tip I would give to parents is to foster foresight. And foresight is an aspect of our nonverbal working memory. So our working memory has two parts. To, well, there's more than two parts, but for, for the purposes of the conversation, it has two main parts. One of them being our nonverbal working memory, which is essentially what we see happening, what we're experiencing inside of our mind. So for self-direction, for a future goal, a child has to be able to pre-experience the future goal inside their mind. So if we think about the only moment that physically exists that we can physically interact with is right now, right? Right now is the only moment that we can actually physically interact with. The future and the past are all, only live in our mind, in particular in our nonverbal working memory, sort of this mental map that our brain makes. And so half of that, part of that, not half, but part is our foresight. So it's that ability to time travel into the future and pre-experience something. 
And this is so, so important because this is what fosters goal setting. It is also critical for inhibition. So if I'm going to inhibit myself from eating the cake right now, I have to see into the future that there's this goal of being healthier, right? And so I have to focus, I have to see that goal in order to rein myself in now. That is the foresight. It is, it's a really important skill that we need to help students foster, our own kids foster. So things like, what do you see yourself doing? Right? So I love, again, all these reflexive questions. So it's, um, I say, all right, I want you to go put your shoes on and get your coat on and don't just leave it there. Tell me, look inside your imagination. Can you see yourself? Show me, point to where you see yourself going. Where do you see yourself going first? Where do you see yourself going second? Maybe we walk it together and pre-experience it first, and then we say go. So we're fostering that foresight. This foresight also is critical for resiliency, fostering resilience in children, because if I know that there's an, I can pre-experience that this will end or that there could be another outcome, it gives me the oomph to keep going for lack of a better word right yeah. so again all of these this this ability to foster what do we see happen next what does that goal look like when you say that you want to go over to your friend's house what does that look like what do you see yourself doing over there with your friend all whenever you're talking about that future or if it's um say related to homework and we have trouble with turning the homework in Tell me, now that you've completed it, now what do you see yourself doing with it? Because our children who do the homework, but they don't turn it in, their homework plan stops after the completion of the homework. I did it. It's done, <laughs> right? No. there's the, And here's where it becomes really tricky for these kiddos is because their homework plan has to extend over a long period of time. Right. So their plan has to extend from the now into this future time. And they have to be able to hold on to all this. This requires that, uh, that nonverbal working memory foresight. Right. So the homework ends and we have to say, OK, now what do you see yourself doing with this homework? OK, I want you to see yourself in the morning where when you walk into the school, what where do you see yourself going? Where do you see yourself going first? Where do you see yourself putting that homework? and really walk through. Maybe they doodle it. If they're drawers, have them doodle. Here, I'm at the locker. Then here's me taking out my paper. But they need to pre-experience these things. Our kiddos who struggle with inhibition and this planning, they're not seeing themselves moving through the world. They're pinging from one stimulus to another, and we have to help them develop. What do you see coming? These are the types of skills that really foster our resilience and our self-determination. And one of my favorite neuroscientists, his name is Lawrence Steinberg. He's written a, he's a, he studies the adolescent brain, but he's written a phenomenal book. Hold on. It just the age of opportunity. I think anyone who works with kids should read it or has children. It's phenomenal. It's not just about adolescents. It's a phenomenal book, the age of opportunity by Lawrence Steinberg. And he talks about how there have been so many studies done that look at future success. And they look at, when we talk about success, not just career or professional, but also personal success, family fulfillment, um, happiness levels, all of that in adults. And there are two skills that predict those future outcomes time and time again. And they are resilience and self-determination. And both of these are fostered through the foresight and our executive function system. Okay, the last thing that I have to recommend for parents is a super easy one. Hopefully, it'll take me a second to tell you. Protein. Protein, protein, protein. Protein at every meal. Protein at every snack. Protein is brain food that endures. It lasts in the brain so it like extends and gives some life to um what the brain needs so protein 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 yeah okay all right let me because we're getting close to an hour so i don't want to 
use any more of your time. Hopefully we just went over a couple of things or not we, but Tara just went over a couple of things. And then this will be, when I download this video, um, I do have a service that transcribes it. So then I have to edit it and all that, but I will pull out and extract some of what she said so that you have it better or, you know, you, you don't have to go through all of it or watch it all again. I will put that there. DC asks, any resources or research you recommend for learning more about the connection of executive functioning to literacy and math? My online educational community. Yeah, okay. that would be. Yep. And I will um, definitely, let's see. I'm trying to think of other resources here. that that make those connections, that talk about those oh, connections. Okay. Let's, Just let's... research studies. Uh, I do have, um, we can go through questions, but I did want to talk about some school to-dos. Okay. Things that when we work with school districts for our clients, there are things that I would love for schools to be able to implement, even though I know that they're going to struggle to be able to do the, you know, therapy percent per se, things that would, that I get really excited about when schools are on board to do. Can I, can I list those off? Yep. Okay. Number one, I want schools to recognize an executive function need. <laughs> And I want them to be able to say, this is executive function. It is not a behavior problem that needs behavior modification or discipline. Okay. So that's number one. And parents, we can help with this because we can obviously advocate. We're the huge advocators. We get exhausted from advocating, but we have to, and we're amazing. So, but be real specific. I would outline these EF needs for your school and be really specific in what they look like in the classroom if you can. So for example, if you say to a teacher, my child has an inhibition need, and in the classroom, what you're going to see is that they yell out and they touch other kids, right? They're not a bad kid. They're not being disruptive, right? They're, they're not trying to be disruptive, but, but be real specific so that the teacher and the school knows what to look for and that this is what inhibition looks like or a, a difficulty with inhibition looks like in your child. So number one. Number two, put the hard classes first in the day. Executive function is not, is not infinite. We do not have an infinite capacity. We have a finite capacity and many of our kiddos use their up all their EF capacity before they've even gotten out the door in the morning. So I can tell you halfway through the day, most kids are done. They have no more executive function capacity left. So it's why on a Friday you come home from work and someone goes, Hey, what are we having for dinner? And you're like, ah! <laughs> because you have no capacity left. You have no executive function left to make that decision. Okay. So hard classes go first in the day. Do not take away recess. Do not take away recess. Do not. It is a right. It is not something that can be leveraged. Movement is essential. It is essential to the brain's ability to recharge, okay? So we have to allow the kids to move, all right? We have to remove temptations from these kiddos. So if there's something that is distracting, if there is something that the child is having trouble inhibiting, right? A big one for kids now is computers. And they're all learning on computers in the classroom. But if they're going over to YouTube or they're going over to this and they're going over to this, they're having trouble inhibiting that, right? So we have to take away the distraction because every time, so let's say that we have a kiddo who struggles with inhibition and he's sitting there on his computer, supposing, supposed to be doing whatever he's supposed to be doing on his computer. And the whole time he's having to be like, nope, don't go on YouTube. Nope, don't go on YouTube. Nope, don't go on YouTube. What's happening is his brain is using EF capacity to inhibit that. Why, why are we forcing his battery to drain to, you know, inhibit that temptation? Just take the temptation away. Figure out what those, those temptations are for the kiddos that they're having to inhibit and remove them. Support, like I talked about, support the development of their foresight and of their hindsight. So that's both parts of nonverbal working memory, foresight, goal setting and planning, hindsight, self-evaluation. How did that work for me? Did that work for me? Should I do it differently next time? Let's come up with a new plan that we're going to try next time because it didn't work great that time. Number six, bring goals closer to the present moment. 
goals live in the future and we have to bring them closer to the present moment for so many of our kiddos. Don't talk about trying to get A's on tests for, with freshmen in high school so that they can go to college in four years. Their brains cognitively cannot see that far into the future. They don't. They really only see a couple of weeks into the future, right? So getting them, if we have these goals that are far away in the future, we have to bring them very close into the present moment and make them real for them in the present moment. Last but not least, input and output. The brain needs both input, what we call receptive processing, output, expressive processing in order to learn. So what this means is that we have our routes that come in, watching, listening, reading are forms of input. But in order to learn and support the EF development, there has to be output of the material, talking, writing, doodling, acting it out, some form of the information coming out. This is a huge way that teachers can support their kids in the classroom. Um, I have a resource for that on my page, terrasumter.com. It's like a, I've got suggestions for every subject area, the way that teachers can have input and output for both of those. So you can find more information on that. And okay. we hit two o'clock. Um, let me just ask one more, because I think for the most part, we did hit, yeah, we did hit, hit on a lot of them. Since EF has become a buzzword in the past decade or two, a new profession has erupted called an executive functioning coach. Hmm. How do you know? I mean, and it's kind of the wild west out there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you know if you're getting a good one? Are they even a thing? Are they necessary or is it, I don't know. Yeah, are they a thing? Absolutely, absolutely. Again, it's just like anybody, any other professional, you have to, you know, talk to other people. You've got to vet them. You know, you really have to do your research and find out who's good. I think what I would be looking for are, you know, is, are the interventions that someone's using, are they going to be strictly tool-based or do we have some sort of scaffolded cognitive intervention to strengthen these areas of processing? So for me, that's kind of how I decipher between the two and, you know, really looking for that. How are we scaffolding these skills and, you know, how are we, it's just like going to the gym. Right. When I talk about scaffolding, I'm talking about I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to start with five pounds, lifting five pounds at, uh, you know, eight reps. And then it's going to be five pounds at 10 reps and 12 reps. And I'm going to increase my rate. It's a uh, weight. It's the same theory. The brain learns in the same exact way that we scaffold the amount of something and the complexity of the information in order for it to get um, replicated and stored. So. Is there, you know, do we have this scaffolded cognitive nature to the intervention or is it all tool based? And some people are fine with tools. Some people, you know, sometimes that's a great method of intervention. It just kind of depends on the individual. But yeah, unfortunately, like you said, it is kind of the Wild West. And, you know, you just have to. Just yeah, have to I mean, I just see a lot of the ones I've heard. And of course, a parent's going to reach out to me because it's not going well, right? Like if it's working, <laughs> they don't contact me. Right. But a lot of the kind of side by side and yeah, tool based here. Well, let's put it in a planner. And I'm like, the kid does not need one more planner. Like they've already nope. lost they've already <laughs> lost seven. You know? There is <laughs> no magical planner. There is not. I wish there was. I mean it would make my job way easier if there was a magical planner. But again, thinking about tools. Tools work if we have a functioning EF system to use the tool, just like a hammer is not going to work unless I have a functioning arm to use the hammer. So it's the same, the same type of premise. The tool is just the tool um, and they can be very useful. They can be very useful. And I use tools in my intervention with kiddos, but at certain points within the EF development, right? We get to a certain level and it's like, okay, maybe we can bring in a clock. And then we're going to go up a little bit more and maybe we can add in a to-do list or maybe we can add it right. But the, and teaching the brain how to use the tool, but just throwing tools is not going to be, and everyone said that. I think it was Meredith earlier who said, uh, I have a million, I can show you my stack of planners. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Tara, for being here. Um, like I said, I will download the video, and then I have to transcribe it, and then I have to edit it. So it will take me some time, but I will get it out there, along with all the links of anything that she talked about today, books she recommended, links to her community. You can, of course, in the meantime, go to tarasumter.com um, and find probably find all the information there. But I will spoon feed it to you in a day or two. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks to everybody for being here. And thanks for having me, Lisa. And I'm the most active on Instagram. So if you go on Instagram, um, at Tara Sumter underscore SLP, I post education just about every day. So it's all education, yeah. executive function she education. She does. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah.